Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next session, well, this final session of the day of AAC in the Cloud. We're excited to have you here for this presentation. Today, we have with us Meryl Schnapp and Mark Brown, who will be talking about developing district-wide programs for AAC implementation and coaching. So we will turn things over to them. Thanks, Mark and Meryl. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Meryl Schnapp and I am here with my colleague, Mark Brown. Um, on the next couple slides, you'll see our disclosures. Um, so Mark and I are AAC implementation coaches at Chicago Public Schools. So it is a very large urban school district. Um, we both began working over this past year. Mark started last summer and I joined in the late fall. And we joined a really well-developed team um, that consisted of our manager, six AAC evaluators, seven assistive technology evaluators, and one access and mounting, mounting specialist. And together they make up what is known as the Assistive Technology Resource Center. Um, so we joined them there. Um, they as a team have always conducted AAC and AT evaluations, made equipment and support recommendations, hosted both mandatory and voluntary trainings on a number of topics, worked with students and teams, and all of the recommendations for equipment went into students' IEPs. Um, they've historically hosted all of these wonderful trainings district-wide, um, but when to, whether or not teams implemented the knowledge that they obtained at those trainings remained inconsistent across the district which led to the question of what is the best way to provide additional ongoing implementation support for staff across the district. And that's where our position came in and the idea of AAC implementation coaching. And so our model for AAC implementation coaching is based on research from instructional coaching in the academic setting as a whole. Um, and we base our model largely on the work of Jim Knight who is an instructional coach um, and has done a lot of research on effective practices in instructional coaching. So this next quote is from his website, instructionalcoaching.com, describing instructional coaches. And instructional coaches partner with teachers to analyze current reality, set goals, identify and explain teaching strategies to hit the goals and provide support until the goals are met. Jim Knight within his body of work describes three different types of coaching. At one end of the spectrum, there's facilitative coaching, and that includes things like growth coaching and cognitive coaching, which is talked about a lot. Um, and those all operate from the assumption that participants know what to do, but they need a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. At the other end of the spectrum is what's known as directive coaching. And that assumes that the participant does not know a particular teaching practice and needs somebody to teach them that practice. In the middle, is something that Jim Knight describes as dialogical coaching, which operates from the assumption that often participants do know what they need to work on, but sometimes it can be helpful to have an expert on best practices who positions the participant as a decision maker. And that is the realm in which he says instructional coaching sits. Um, Jim Knight also discusses partnership principles within his work. And Mark is gonna go into a little more specifically about what those are later, but is it, it is a set of ideals um, that govern the coaching relationship and that ultimately honor the autonomy of the professional with whom you're working. So at the center of every coaching partnership and coaching relationship is the relationship itself and honoring that person's autonomy. Um, and that goes back to research on motivation theory, self-determination theory, Ed, uh, Rich Ryan and Ed DC, um, really you know, have that evidence-based stating that having that autonomy supportive feedback and that autonomy supportive environment promotes intrinsic motivation to learn and to grow. Um, Jim Knight also talks about something that he refers to as an impact cycle, and that is a coaching cycle that occurs in three steps. So in the first step, the teacher identifies and gains a picture of their current reality, often by watching a video of themselves um, and their teaching practices. And they use that to identify an area for growth and to set a goal. The second step involves learning. 
Um, and that is the part in which a coach might model a practice. They're going to really learn steps to a practice and they're gonna modify that practice to fit their needs. And then the last step is improving. So the teacher implements the strategies and continues to modify that strategy as necessary. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we came into a team that already had these great trainings um, that they were providing to various professionals in the district. Um, and so I th it's important to really explain how that fits together and how it differs from coaching, because uh, both components are necessary within our program. Um, so this Venn diagram kind of talks about how that works within our department. Um, the next couple of videos are really going to demonstrate what training looks like. So training, what sets it apart specifically, is training really relies on that expert model where there is somebody, you know, at the front of the room or in a video who's an expert on a topic and explains it to a group, really with, um, you know, instructions of how to implement it um, and the information to just go ahead and this is how it should work. And we have a couple of examples of that in the next, the next couple of short video clips. I'm gonna make sure I'm sharing audio. One second. Yeah, I don't I think it's happen. coming through. Yeah, I was just gonna say, if I can't hear that once, so we might wanna try it one more time. There we go. Can you give me a thumbs up if you hear it okay? With a touch chat. How to get started with touch chat. First, turn your iPad on. Select the home button to open. Locate the touch chat icon, which is this gray box with the orange circle in the middle that says touch chat on it. Select the app. Here you'll see a list of the different vocabulary. We will scroll until we see word power, select word power, and then you will select the group. I will now walk through the steps for enabling and using guided access. Begin by exiting the communication application by pressing the Apple Home button. Next, locate the Apple settings. On the left side of the screen, scroll until you locate accessibility. So both of those videos showed one way that training occurs within our district, and that is with those asynchronous trainings. Um, some of them are operational in nature, like those two videos, but they also include topics like aided language stimulation, descriptive teaching, using core vocabulary, um, some literacy strategies, things like that. And pre-COVID, um, they occurred live in person as well. Um, all of this contrasts with training, where it isn't that presenter as an expert, but instead it occurs um, more on a more conversational back and forth basis, um, and is really a collaborative process. And so the next video shows a clip from one of our coaching sessions um, as an example of how that looks in contrast. How do you think you can scaffold an activity um, to encourage those other kids to, to write, and, write in and response to a drill prompt? Well, and I think like choices are fine, right? Like I think it's like fine that we like generate choices. I think when I started with predictable chart writing, I was like, oh my gosh, I need choice, you know, I need choices or whatever. And now I'm not as scared, you know, I'm not, I'm not as nervous. Now with virtual chart writing, I, I don't need to make my visuals now, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's fun. Like if I did, like, what did you do at recess? What'd you do at recess today? I feel like we could generate enough from my peer models mm -hmm. to then have these have a choice have choices. 
and then again have the peer model like build the sentence or do the writing and then use them as models for the other students again i think we would run into similar like v would then just copy from someone but at least it's like a starting point mm -hmm. yeah what what other and i you're using some of them already um with with more concrete questions so i'm just curious what other um scaffolds could you use to help those students generate ideas how so again, there really is that contrast between training where there is somebody, you know, the expert telling you what to do, describing the strategies, and that coaching that really is that back and forth reciprocal process. So why include coaching in the process? Um, Jim Knight included this chart in an article from two thousand that was published in 2015, and he looked at prior research on training and coaching and found that when training is used alone, those strategies ended up implemented long-term only about 10% of the time. But when a coaching element is built into a company that training, it, uh, use of those strategies and implementation increases to 85% of the time. So coaching can be very valuable within this framework. In addition to looking at the literature from instructional coaching as a whole, we also looked into prior research on AAC coaching. And there was a bunch of it. We included some select articles in this chart. And we found a bunch of common themes among, among the literature. The first most important one is there is a lot of supportive evidence for AAC implementation coaching and its efficacy. A lot of prior research was either activity specific and activity based or focused on aided language stimulation. And that goes by a number of different names throughout the literature. The other thing we found is that there are different operational definitions of training and coaching and the interplay between the two within the literature. Um, so defining coaching and what it would look like is really important um, when starting a program. Something else that we found that occurred a lot um, and that a lot of the literature was based off of was Kent Walsh and McNaughton's eight-step model for communication partner instruction. This wasn't universal across literature, but it has been frequently built upon in order to develop other AAC coaching models. Um, and so the eight steps include a pretest and commitment to the instructional pro uh, program, a strategy description, um, of the targeted strategy and its component skills, and as well as a method for remembering the steps involved in implementing the strategy. So that often included mnemonics, like what you may have used to remember your high school locker combination. Um, and some of those mnemonics that come in are across the coaching literature, s'mores, master pal, all of both of those tend to follow this model. Um, step three is a strategy demonstration where the instructors model the use of a targeted strategy. Then there's verbal practice of the strategy steps, um, controlled practice and feedback in a controlled environment with gradual fading of instructor prompts and feedback. Then there's advanced practice and feedback um, or communication part, uh, practice the targeted strategy in multiple situations and also within that natural environment. So that would be bringing it for a teacher to bring it back into a classroom, an SLP to bring it into a therapy session. Um, then there's the post-test and commitment to long-term strategies. And finally, um, generalization. And within our framework, um, some of these steps fit more within our operational definition of training. And then others go on to what we describe as coaching. So once again, we're really lucky to be joining a team that handles some of this for us so we can go right into that coaching partnership, um, building upon a previously developed understanding of a strategy. Yeah, and really, so once we've understood and developed the balance that coaching is going to play with training, and then also understood the efficacy behind both instruction, instructional coaching and the merger between AAC and instructional coaching, we started to develop our model. And really we have two prerequisites to participate and partner with a coach. 
the first prerequisite is that you're motivated to partner with the coach, meaning that the, the process is entirely voluntary. And we've had to be pretty strategic about how we connect with teams because of its voluntary nature. So we can't really generate requests or referrals through an administrative lens because then the process may not be viewed as voluntary. Um, in addition, the, the second prerequisite is that the team must be trained in AAC. And that's really what Merrill was describing. You know, there's that eight step model and the training piece is really going to be important for the first one through one to four steps and then coaching can pick up from there. And our team currently offers 10 plus different training options, mostly asynchronous right now. And they cover a wide variety of topics that you heard Merrill describe being aided language simulation, descriptive teaching, as well as operational competencies and much, much more. The training piece is also vital for us as coaches because we don't want the first time that a team hears about aided language stimulation to be with us. We instead want them to be familiar with the term and have implemented or implemented it or at least tried to, and then they can partner with a coach if they're motivated to do so to help optimize its implementation in the classroom. And then the participants that we are partnering with, that's really the staff that works with the students who are using AAC. Uh, in some of the literature that we described that merges AAC and coaching, some of those studies looked at coaching parents or even coaching the actual students using AAC. For our program right now, we're really focusing on the staff members, but there is some variability that we acknowledge as well. Also important in this process is building rapport and trust with the individuals that we're partnering with. This can be a pretty vulnerable process. Um, if, if someone is getting to the point in the coaching process that they're letting us observe and they're sharing things that they maybe think they don't do so well, we really need to honor and respect their trust. And we, we really do our best to, to cherish that and maintain it as, as much as we possibly can. So the, the program that we have here at CPS is very self-driven. The individuals that we partner with are really guiding the process. They're creating the goals and dictating the frequency that they'd like to uh, meet with us. So there's a ton of variability, but even in that variability, we've found that there are two primary pathways that teams generally follow. The first of which is an informal consultation which usually consists of one to two sessions. It's mostly that facilitative coaching, which again, operates from the assumption that the team knows what they're doing, but maybe just would like some resources. Maybe they have a few questions or would like to brainstorm some ideas that they have. Additionally, this informal consultation, we're not really creating goals just yet or conducting observations. Although if the team wants to take it to that level, we absolutely allow that and adjust as needed. The second primary pathway is more formal coaching. So this is where you're gonna see the consistent and frequent meetings. Teams are creating goals for themselves. We're conducting one or several observations and we're even modeling particular strategies so that teams can see what things might look like. And then they have a chance to practice them themselves. We also, Excuse me. We also encourage teams to record the lessons and observations that we're conducting. The reason being so that they can go back after the fact, watch the tape from a different perspective, and then we meet and discuss what we both saw and brainstorm ideas to improve it or talk about things that were strengths that the individual hopes to continue doing in the future. Merrill mentioned earlier partnership principles. And I'm going to describe the, the six that really guide every single interaction that we have with the coaching partners in our district. And that's regardless of whether it's a meeting, observation, or even email communication, we maintain these six principles and rely on them pretty heavily. The first one being equality, coaches, teachers, paraprofessionals, whoever's in this coaching process, we're all equal partners for the duration of the process. Number two choice, as long as the team is operating within AAC best practice, which are the, the boundaries that Merrill and I set, they have the ultimate decision-making power, whether that's the goals, 
the strategies they'd like to work on, or um, even how a particular strategy is implemented in the classroom. They get to make those choices and always are the ultimate decision makers. Number three, professional development should respect and empower participant voices. This has become particularly important when we're coaching in a group context because we know that certain individuals may not feel as comfortable sharing their true thoughts and opinions in that group context. So what we've developed is uh, based off of Jim Knight's literature is a process where we'll meet with the group collectively and then we'll have subsequent one-on-one -on -one meetings with each person in the group because then they may feel more comfortable sharing those more intimate thoughts and feelings um, and even concerns about things that are going on in the classroom or things they'd like to work on. Number four, authentic dialogue with no attempt to make your viewpoint prevail. So we're not approaching with any particular viewpoint or agenda. We're really, really letting the team guide the process and we're listening authentically and really trying to hear them out and let them guide the process. And obviously if they ask us questions or want our thoughts and opinions, we provide that, but then they again, always have that ultimate decision-making power. Number five, Reflection, the coaching partners have the freedom to consider ideas prior to adopting them. This has been really noticeable when teams have created goals with us. A handful of times a team has created a goal and then after attempting to address the goal or collecting data, they may realize that it's not really capturing what they hoped it would capture or maybe they'd like to look at something different after learning some new information. So after reflecting on uh, what they've done, they have the chance to go ahead and change the goals. And that's a part of the adaptable nature of our coaching model. The sixth and final partnership learning principle is praxis. Teachers should apply their learning to real life applications as they learn them. And you can see how that interplays pretty significantly with reflection because a lot of times people won't really know how to reflect or adapt what they're doing until they put it into a real life application. So now that we've laid the foundation for our team, the, the wonderful colleagues that we have that conduct evaluations and trainings, and now this new coaching program, as well as the efficacy behind instructional coaching, AAC and coaching, and the partnership principles, we wanna introduce a case study. And we actually have two, but this first one will have more of the videos that we'd like to show. So we've worked with many phenomenal individuals, but the videos we'll show is of one particular teacher who's just been amazing to work with over the past few months. She has a special education classroom with students that have moderate needs. These students have a mixture of verbal, unintelligible verbal and nonverbal communication modalities. You may also notice that we're using letters to represent student names. And you may hear us use the word SICA, which just represents the paraprofessionals in our district and specifically in this classroom. It's important to note too that at the beginning of this coaching process, this teacher really wanted to work on descriptive teaching, core language and aided language stimulation. However, after a couple of meetings, some observations, she really came back to the drawing board and wanted to work on something else. And what she, the, the, the direction she wanted to head in was more of shared reading, predictable chart writing, and alternative pencils. As we noted earlier, um, this is more of a formal coaching process. So uh, the videos you're going to see are a meeting that's occurred a week after an observation that we conducted. And this teacher was willing to record the observation. So she's gone ahead watch the tape and now she's coming to the meeting ready to reflect on the strengths of that observation and also talk about things that she'd like to work on. Towards the end of this video, you're gonna hear the teacher mention a little bit about how she's providing prompts for students to participate in writing activities. And she is brainstorming whether or not she should be, be providing choices or open-ended prompts and how to do that. So here's the first video of the case study. Reflecting back on when this all started with alternative pencils and predictable chart writing, 
how do you feel that things are right now? If you were, if you were to think back about how some of those first activities went. I mean, I definitely, I feel the least confident in the alternative pencils, but I, I feel really confident even in shared reading now, you know, like, and using core and making comments and, you know, giving the wait time and having the kids respond with their comments. Um, so I definitely feel way more confident in that. I feel like predictable chart writing is now not easy, but like I, I have it now. It's like built into our routine, you know, we actually did like we've been doing a community helpers unit. So we did two different predictable charts. We did I want to be and then, the, you know, the kids said what they wanted to be when they grew up, whatever. And then the next one was like, I can be. So oh, I cool. like, but it was the same topic, you know, so it was it was cool to see. I mean, obviously some kids still needed the prompt because they kept going back to I want. And I'm like, no, but you can be anything. What can you be, you know? Um, but that was like, I've never done like two predictable charts on the same topic with different words. So I thought that was cool. That is cool. I like that a lot. Um, is there something that you would like to continue to work on? Um, is there, is there like a focus area, I guess, just building off of Mark? I mean, I still want to work on writing, mm -hmm. whether it's alternative pencils or whatever writing, but more independent writing, because I, I just, that's a missing piece for me. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's also just one of those things where in this setting in cluster, it like in a re even like in a resource setting, when I was a resource teacher, I could put a prompt up. I would, we would do like journal writing. I was like, what did you do at recess today? And they would like, you know, they couldn't write, they would tell me, right? I feel like if I give an open-ended prompt like that, I don't necessarily get responses. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because they don't know, because I haven't taught them how to answer open-ended because I'm always like this or that, you know? Mm -hmm. Or it's just not something we've done. Like, I know, I know I would be like, oh, I blame it. he would tell me verbally, like everything or why, you know, like why, I would get yeah. great models if I get open-ended, but it's like the, the rest of the kids, when I don't give the choices. Reflect a quick note to just rewinding back to the, um, AAC coaching literature review that we provided in the beginning. Uh, if you remember, a common theme was that many of the studies were focusing on aided language simulation, which we all understand the importance of. Um, but you, you're noticing too that we've expanded what we're coaching on. So it's not just aided language simulation. Um, we're also using other strategies too. So that's that's how our pro one way that our program is modified or deviates a little bit from um, some of the literature that's already out there. And something that you may have noticed in that video, and hopefully you'll notice in the upcoming videos, is the pattern of questions that we're using when we interact with a coaching partner. We're using really reflective questions that are open-ended in nature. And we have a, a bank of questions that are appropriate and that we'd like to use, but they're oftentimes guided by the coaching experience. So if we come in with plan A and the coaching partner takes it in a different direction, we adjust and modify the questions that we're asking based on the context and um, goals and desires of the teacher for that conversation. I also want to point out that we provide, try to provide, provide a great deal of wait time for our coaching partners in these meetings. The reason being is because we want them to really think critically about their response and then also have time to fully communicate that response. Some examples just quickly of questions that we use with some deal of frequency uh, include what's going well with AAC implementation. Tell me what things you wish were going differently. What strategies have you tried and how did it go? After watching your recorded session, what surprised you? What does ideal AAC implementation look like for your students? What barriers are preventing ideal AAC implementation from happening? And we borrowed from a set of questions that Jim Knight outlines and just adapted those questions that are really meant for an educational context, but just adapted them for AAC. And here's
here, this should be another video example. Uh, and I, I'd like you to focus on and pay attention to uh, the questions that we're asking being reflective, open-ended, and then also that wait time that we're trying to provide too. Cycling back to kind of just his, his one word comments about some of those pages. Um, I know Mark pointed out how, how awesome it is when you're recasting all these statements and building all of that language. Is there a way that you can tie that all together with modeling that some of that core? I guess I, I just feel like I don't I don't want to push him too far. He's also he's so interesting. He's very echolalic. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm saying like I see monkey, he's not saying monkey, like he, you know, like I don't know if not that that means that he's not ready for it. Mm -hmm. like, there's nothing to do with his verbal like abilities, but I don't I just I don't know. I might need to just start with like see monkey instead of I see, you know, like mm -hmm. I feel like I've naturally always been like I want, I see. But maybe he even needs to be like see monkey or see car, see even just like a two word mm -hmm. phrase. So I, I read that at one point he he was looking through the book and he said motorcycle. Yeah. How can you respond to that? Oh, you're telling me you see motorcycle and then just using that native language like I see motorcycle too. I love that. Yeah. I, yeah. Maybe I'm not doing enough modeling. And just for the record, this teacher does a ton of modeling, um, but you can see how that reflective process may help ignite or find opportunities to just improve upon a skill set that's all, maybe even already a strength. I'm going to show another clip from the same coaching case study, um, and we're approaching the second case study uh, as well. Um, but before I show the tape, I want to read this quote, and it references interviews, but we're using meetings and interviews interchangeably. And it's, it states that interviews provide teachers a chance to see you not as a professional developer, some expert coming in, but as someone like them. It's that principle of equality that you're together. It's one to one. It's not I'm better than you or I'm going to come tell you something. It's we're going to have a conversation. So hopefully in this next video, you can tie all of these concepts together. So the open ended questioning, the reflective nature of the questions, wait time the conversational nature of the interaction, as well as those partnership principles, right? The equality, voice, choice, so on and so forth. Hey, given that this was the first time for N doing these mm -hmm. kinds of activities, is there anything that really surprised you from the experience? Um, I mean, I, I'm just like, I was pleasantly surprised mm -hmm with how comfortable he was going between his device and the book mm. because he was pointing like he pointed to the book um i think it was motorcycle like you know when i was trying to build icy blue van or icy blue car and he was like motorcycle and then he touched it on the touch chat so i mean like i feel like that was a hard thing even when i'm thinking back to like not my aac it was just my core guy my core people it was hard, like going back and forth between the core board and then the book. It was like trying to be organized. And he was like very, I feel like that came very natural to him. And after I just modeled, I don't feel like I didn't even model it. You know, like he, we started reading about vehicles. He immediately went to groups and immediately went to vehicles, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was cool. Hey, given that. So. Uh, we've we've had this program up and running for the most part for uh, one one school year, and we've actually ended up coaching 52 individuals. Uh, although we've connected with many more individuals than what that 52 says, the 52 is just the the people that we have ended up coaching, and that coaching process has impacted 118 students, and this has all been done through 106 meetings. 18 observations and six video recordings. All of that has impacted 22 different schools in Chicago public schools. I do want to note, though, 
And you can see at the very top that program development was a multi-year process. The, um, the, the drive and the push to create a coaching position and a coaching team started in 2019. So that we're talking about three years of getting a position created, opening it up, hiring people. And then the program development piece also took quite a bit of time. And then also when we, when we finally got to a point that we were ready to start working with teams in the school district, we also were, were intentional about rolling it out slowly. So um, these, these not work, we're happy and proud of these numbers. And it's where we ended up after one, after our first year but they don't necessarily tell the, the full picture because this has been a multi-year process and we did roll out the program slowly so that we can learn how to best serve the staff members in our school district. So where do we go from here? We'd really like to expand the program, obviously the number of participants that we work with, but we also wanna broaden the kinds of individuals that we're working with. It's primarily been teachers, speech pathologists, and paraprofessionals so far, but we think there's an opportunity to work with OTs, PTs, case managers, social workers, even principals and assistant principals, really anyone that works with some deal of consistency with students that use AAC. We think that there could potentially be benefit for coaching. In addition, we would like to explore collecting pre and post data. We are navigating that process slightly right now by collecting participant feedback. So the individuals and teams that we've coached, we've sent out a survey to get their information. We unfortunately don't have the results for this presentation, uh, but we're really looking forward to, to seeing how we can make adjustments in the future. And we're especially interested in doing some kind of pre and post data collection for student outcomes. So just as an example, what did use of core language look like prior to a coaching experience versus after the, st the staff that works with the student has been coached. Um, these are conversations that we've had throughout the program development, but just due to the nature of remote learning and also this being a new program that we're just getting off the ground, um, we've opted to kind of push that out a little bit. We also want to continue to empower staff at schools one way we're hoping to do this is through creating a coaching network. So some kind of a forum through Google Classroom that uh, we could have a coaching cohort of the staff that we've worked with and they can interact, share ideas, brainstorm, ask questions. And then Meryl and I will also be available to moderate and provide our input as well. So whether you're uh, currently a coach and would like to brush up on your skill set, or maybe you're in a school district that doesn't have AAC coaching and you are interested in creating a program, we have several resources we'd like to share that were helpful for us in developing our, our team. So the, these three are books. The first two are by Jim Knight, focus on teaching using video for high impact instruction and instructional coaching, a partnership approach to moving instruction. And the third is by Elena Aguilar, titled Coaching for Equity, Conversations That Change Practice. There are many other coaching books, but these are kind of the three that we pulled that we thought would have a, a, the largest impact for our audience. Additionally, we have our Assistive Technology Resource Center website through Chicago Public Schools. It's located at cps.edu slash AT resources. You just go over to the Augmentative Communication dropdown and select AAC coaching. What you'll find on there is some of the information that we've presented on tonight, um, as well as some additional information. You'll also find Meryl and my contact information if you'd like to reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns. I also want to note that the structure of our program and the information you'll find uh, on our website is specific to what we've developed at CPS, but it's not the right solution or the solution or the coaching model. It's just how we've adapted the pre-existing literature to meet our needs. And I'd encourage you to do the same. Take what's beneficial and leave what's not, and then continue making adjustments from there. 
three more quick resources. The first two are specific to an educational context, but um, you've just heard a presentation about how you can adapt that to AAC. So check those out. And then the third is an article actually by a physician. And it just describes that, you know, top athletes and singers have coaches. Why don't other professions such as those in the medical field or educational field? One last video to, to wrap up the first case study before we go to our second one. Um, this is uh, this is a really exciting video to, to us because it demonstrates how in the coaching process, uh, coaching partners can develop creative ideas to solve the problems that they've identified. So in this last video, you'll hear our uh, teacher partner describe how she can use alternative pencils throughout the school day, as opposed to just at, a, at one particular activity. And she kind of just blurted this out in the middle of a conversation. So this is completely self-generated. Now that I'm thinking about it, there's like other parts of the day, for example, like when we do phonics, when we do spelling, like, right. And then they have their house paper and it's like, I'm, whatever, like, let's sound it out. Let's spell the word. I should actually, cause I was doing this for S. I don't know why I should do it for him too. Because I said, fine motor is an issue for him. I should just have him use his alphabet board to point to spell and then have the Sika or whoever like write it because the Sika is basically doing hand over hand to write. So instead of that, let's do more of the alternative pencils then. That's a great idea. And you know, like, I don't know why I'm thinking like, oh, alternative pencils is like done at my table. It's like, should be at other times too, you know? Are there, any, are there any other times in addition to the moment you just described that would be appropriate? I mean, I obviously in math, when we, we do like math journals, um, and again, it's the same thing. Like the Sika is doing hand over hand with them because we're also like, we're drawing out the problem. We're like crossing out for subtraction. You, you can like do some of that, like draw circles and stuff. But then when we're writing number sentences, for example, like that's a time when he could be pointing on his number board to build the sentence. Now I'm and we have one more case example to wrap up our presentation. Uh, Meryl's going to introduce it, and I'll, I'll hop on uh, Slack to kind of look at the responses as they come in. So if you're not on Slack, go ahead and log in, and um, here's Meryl with the case example prompt. So um, the teacher we've been looking at the uh, coaching example from, she's somebody we've worked with for a long time. Um, we actually just recorded that feedback session once um, our presentation was accepted into the conference because we're like, oh, let's get videos. We're let's, we asked for permission. We just recorded one session. Um, and that really is a ideal case um, to look at because uh, she was super motivated. She'd taken every training our department offered um, and was really reflective and eager to learn and to, to put in the work. Um, however, we do know that's not always the case. Um, because of that, this next example is, is not a real person, but it's based on some very real scenarios that we've encountered and that I'm sure, sure other people have encountered as well. Um, so imagine you're working at an elementary school. You feel comfortable supporting AAC for your students, including John, a second grader with cerebral palsy, who uses cough drop on an iPad. John receives pull-out services, but is in general education classes. Um, one of John's teachers is new to the school and you notice he has some difficulty creating opportunities for John to participate. You've made some suggestions in the past, but have not observed much follow through. So we're going to go through some, some questions and to kind of brainstorm how to imply some of those coaching principles to this scenario. So based on what you've learned about coaching, which of the following should you not do. Um, and if you all could read through it and just drop your the number of your response into the into the Slack chat, we can talk through it. So I'm a really bad multitasker. So I'll um, answer these questions that are already in the Slack chat. Once we're done, I promise. I think some people put four in here. Yeah, that's absolutely, 
Um, I'm seeing a lot of fours. Uh, demand he make changes and send journal articles to justify why. That's absolutely correct. And unfortunately, it's something that I am, before I like really dug deep into the coaching literature, it's something I'm absolutely guilty of. And I can tell you from personal experience, it, it did not work for me. Um, I was like, oh, you know, I know this teacher, you know, tries to use evidence-based practices in other aspects of teaching. Let me send them the evidence. And, um, you know, typically that's not acknowledging what the barriers are. It's not building that relationship and effective instructional coaching really has to center that relationship first um, in order to be effective. So that is absolutely correct. Moving on, what is important to keep in mind regarding John's teacher? And I will let you all read through those options. And again, drop the number in the Slack. Again, I'm seeing a lot more fours and that is absolutely correct. Um, all of these may be barriers that are preventing um, this teacher from implementing those strategies. So an important starting point really is to sit down with that teacher and just have a conversation. Um, you know, non-judgmental, just kind of see, see where he is at that moment and, and what his perspective is on the situation. Because um, that teacher's um, experience may is likely unique to that teacher um, and is going to provide some valuable insight in moving forward. Um, John's teacher is open to having that initial meeting. During the meeting, each of the following questions or statements would be appropriate except, um, again, read through the choices, drop your response in the Slack. I'm seeing ones here exactly. Why aren't you providing more opportunities for John to participate? Um, that's exactly right. Um, that is not, not going to be helpful in building that relationship and providing that valuable reflection. Um, so right on target. Um, and then our final question um, regarding this case study, and then we can open it up to all of your questions. Um, you and the teacher have now met three times and discussed AAC, barriers, and a plan to move forward. You can or should do which of the following, and more than one of these may be appropriate. So you can drop multiple numbers um, into that Slack chat. So I'm seeing um, responses that say one, three, and four. So offer to model a lesson or activity based on what you've discussed. Explore making attainable, incremental, measurable goals for the teacher with his input. Um, and offer to continue meeting or conduct an observation in order to explore ways to improve AAC in the classroom. All of those are absolutely appropriate and valuable. Um, and again, with those measurable goals, we do um, encourage those to be generated by the coaching participant themselves. 
um, we'll offer guidance, you know, we'll help them paint that picture of their reality in terms of like recording a lesson, looking it over, talking together about what we schools. Um, but the goals in those focus areas really do come from the participants themselves pretty consistently. Um, okay, so it looks like we have about 10 minutes and we'd love to open it up to questions. I saw there were some here. I'm seeing, uh, yeah, I saw there were some here um, already. So we can scroll back up and look at some of those as well. Let's see this one. I'm going to read uh, Laura's question. Hi, Laura. I hope you're doing well. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, so the, the question in the Slack chat, what did your upper, upper level administration look like for your coaching program? Also wondering what your diversity and AAC systems look like in classrooms and if that made a difference. Were classrooms with a variety of different systems more or less equally successful compared to staff with classrooms that uh, with a single identical AAC system across students? That's a really good question, uh, but I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that question. Uh, I'll start with the administration piece. We luckily have a, a wonderful manager that was familiar with the coaching literature in the educational context. So she's who was fighting um, along with some other individuals in our district for the coaching program. Um, so we owe her a great deal of gratitude and appreciation for that. Um, and so she, she's constantly fighting for us and advocating for the program. And then there oftentimes is a large or a great deal of diversity in terms of the AAC systems that are being used in classrooms. I don't know that there's a, we've found any trend in terms of what's more successful or less successful. Um, we see some classrooms where it is maybe just one device classrooms where it is multiple devices, but the same kind, and then different kinds, we see it all. And um, I don't know, Meryl, do you think anything has stood out in terms of a pattern or trend? Um, I feel like, and this is one of those things that that is kind of unique to the process of coaching. Um, a lot of our, our, the teachers and the SLPs who we've worked with have come up with different solutions um, for working with these mixed groups. Um, and so it's one of those things that really I feel like there are multiple right answers um, depending on the comfort level of that specific teacher. Um, we definitely have groups and classrooms that have a whole range of communication systems, um, devices, high tech, low tech. Um, and so we've had some teachers come up with some pretty unique strategies for, for implementing them and switching them throughout the day. Um, be it, you know, picking one system to model each day, each lesson, having a default, you know, core board that they'll model during whole group lessons and then modeling on students' devices with their permission um, during individual instruction. Um, it really, it really does vary greatly. Um, and I feel like there are, there are multiple right answers. Um, there's some questions in here about time. So uh, one from Marissa, how did teachers get release time to participate in the coaching sessions? It seems like a big time commitment. And then Brianna asked, um, are you both full-time in the coaching role or do you have other responsibilities as well? How long would a typical meeting be or a typical meeting be with, with a staff member? Um, so it can be a, a big time commitment, but we have structured the program so that the, the coaching partners are driving the frequency of our visits and observations. So we work really around their schedules um, and we are both full-time coaches. We, I, I think it's safe to say we wear a bunch of different hats, but we don't have necessarily a caseload of students that we have to do therapy with. Um, or other formal responsibilities in that regard. Um, a typical meeting, I don't, I think it averages between 30 and 60 minutes, um, but we have done just 15 minute check-ins. Um, usually the observations have been about 45 minutes, but we've also done just a quick 15 minute observation. So I, all of my answers are just speaking to the variability in, 
our coaching program. And that has been intentional on our end. Um, we think that we can cast a wider net if we uh, allow for that variability. Yeah, I feel like on average, they're, they're scheduled for about an hour and tend to occur during the teacher's prep period. Um, or sometimes teachers will request it during lunch. Um, they, and they tend to average about an hour to um, Mark is really good at keeping track of time and being respectful of it. Um, I tend to just talk until someone stops me in those meetings. So I've had some that have extended over an hour as well, um, but it averages out to about that hour. Um, and like Mark said, it is, it is driven by that teacher. Um, and yeah, like we, like Mark said, um, we are full-time in a coaching role, which is very lucky um, and it's one of the perks of being in such a large school district because as we expand the program, there are thousands of teachers with whom we hope to work and who are available for us to work with as well as SLPs, OTs, PTs, principals. Um, so we, we have tens of thousands of professionals that we're hoping to connect with um, as we continue to expand and grow. Um, over this past year, like Mark said, we've worn very many different hats. Um, we've, we've put a lot of effort into networking with various professionals across the district um, in order to get the word out and, and have that slow rollout of the program as well um, as supporting, supporting the assistive technology department in various other ways. Um, I also saw a question in the chat about if it, you don't have a dedicated team, how would you have time to do this type of coaching? Um, so we're really lucky to have a whole um, AAC team to work with and AT team to work with. Um, but something that I did prior to starting this position, um, you know, my coaching probably wasn't as evidence-based, um, but I would write consultation time into my students' IEPs very, very frequently um, for coaching and training of uh, various staff members. Um, and then I would use that consultation time in order to um, meet with the teams whenever possible. So um, if you're US-based and you have that system, um, that is a possibility as well. So you can make sure that there is time blocked off within your schedule. Um, are there... Yep. About two minutes left too. So maybe we can have one more and wrap it, wrap it up. Um, oh, here's one uh, also from Laura. Also, she says, also curious as to strategies for staff who don't meet the criteria in the sense um, that they aren't willing or motivated to accept strategies. Any thought, not that this ever happens. Um, Right, now, it doesn't happen, but it also it does happen quite a bit. We've experienced it several times. Um, and it, no matter what answer we give, there isn't going to be a perfect solution. And the reason being is because you can't just force someone to make a, a change like this. And that's part of the reason why uh, in the literature comparing coaching and training, why the numbers are a little bit lower for training is because Trainings are oftentimes mandated, so people have to show up, but then there's nothing to mandate that it's put into practice. So as far as tangible things that you can do, I would say try and build rapport, um, use a, a zone of proximal development, just like we use for our students, but use it with the um, coaching partner. So if they're not ready to go full aided language stimulation, maybe just talk about how they can do it a couple times throughout the day or something like that. Um, but I, I think trust and rapport are probably the two biggest things that I could leave you with. Um, we also, I, I know you guys already do that too, though. We also bank a lot on um, building, building connections and building rapport through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes a per someone might not want to work with us, but maybe a professional adjacent to them does. Um, so, you know, we might have somebody try and connect us with a teacher um, who's a little hesitant, but the SLP or one of their paraprofessionals are more open um, to coaching and to working on those strategies. And we try and use them as that model and as that connection so that we, we can build that rapport um, slowly and over time. Uh, we also sometimes coach professionals to be coaches. 
So if we don't have that in for that relationship building, but somebody else does, um, we, we've helped some other professionals gain those strategies so that they, they can spread the word, I, I guess. Um, yeah, looks like we're right at six o'clock right now. So uh, really appreciate all of you attending and also participating. Um, thank you so much. And um, I hope that everyone's enjoyed this year's AAC in the cloud. Thank you. Also, please feel free to um, reach out to us. Um, our email addresses are on that website. We are happy to connect with anyone. Um, and we can try, I might try and hang out in the chat and uh, respond to some more questions. But so we'd love to have you in the chat for a little longer. We'll keep you as long as we can. If that works. <laughs> Mark and Meryl, thank you so much for, for sharing these insights. And I, I really appreciate the tone that that relationship is kind of that the base that we need to build from and the, the, it, this was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks to all who attended and who've been part of AAC in the Cloud 2021. Um, this is our final session of the year. So we will close things out. Feel free to hang out in the chat and, and rub shoulders with some of our presenters and others who are in there. But thank you for being part of this presentation and the conference in general. And we will see you next year. Thank you so much for having us.